we are going to honor Asian Pacific American history and human rights and equality. And we're excited. We have some wonderful, wonderful guests with us today, and I can't wait to get involved in, in our discussion today. Um, we have an all-star panel today, and each one of them has helped to enrich our Asian and Pacific Islander communities. They've been instrumental in the quest for equality, and I think that all of us want that. As the Cook County clerk, I've been honored to work with these individuals and the agencies that they represent to promote voting rights in particular and ballot access. It's been a long road coming, but I am really excited that we now have 12, count them, 12 languages on our Cook County ballot. I'm excited about that. That has allowed us access across Cook County for folks who can see their language on their ballot. While other states are looking for opportunities to um, shut down access, Illinois, be proud that you're an Illinoisan and you're able to see your native language on our ballot. So with that, I want to first introduce our, our guest today, um, Jerry Clarito, he's, he's the retired founding executive director of the Alliance for Filipinos for Immigrant Rights and Empowerment. I love that word empowerment, don't you? In this role, he led the efforts to organize and mobilize Filipino Americans in registering voters, leading voting campaigns, and working to address the root causes of inequalities racism, and systemic injustices. He is currently the co-convener of the Filipino American Human Rights Alliance of Chicago, and we are thrilled to have Jerry on our team working with the Cook County Clerk's Office as a language advocate. Thank you, uh, Jerry, for being with us today. Say hello to the folks. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Claire Karen. Okay, um, next up we have uh, Amy Gunn, who is a senior counsel for the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Now this organization does work that reduce the barriers to voting and improve civic participation, especially in communities of color and low income communities. She also serves on the board of Common Cause Illinois and the American Civil Liberties Union of Illinois. Her experience includes leading statewide voter protection for 2016 and for 2020 elections, partnering with community members in the criminal legal system to expand voter access, to advocate for communities of color during Illinois' redistricting. Very, very important redistricting. It's happening right now. And advising local election authorities as they implement the first Hindi ballots in the country. Amy, say hello to our folks out here. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Clark Yarbrough, for having me here as part of this event. Great. Thank you for being here, taking the time out to be with us. Now, Enhi Choi, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Am I saying your name correctly? I want to get it right. It's Inhe. Thank you Inhe for asking. Choi. Inhe. Okay is the executive director of the HANA Center, a Chicago area nonprofit working to meet the critical needs of the Korean and Asian American and multi-ethnic immigrant communities. She wants to build power towards systemic change. And she's been with the organization since its launch in February of 2017. Among other roles, she's worked as the program director at the Crossroads Fund, a public foundation that raises money to fund social justice work in the Chicago area, and as the community resource specialist for the Commission on Asian American Affairs in the Harold Washington Administration in the city of Chicago. So why don't you say hi to all of our folks out here in Rotary Land. Hi, everyone. Looking forward to this conversation. Okay, so so uh, let me just reiterate uh, before we get started with our panelists that um, 
And, you know, I was elected clerk in 2018, and the office was at that time offering voting language access in Spanish, Chinese, and in Hindi. Working with the uh, Cook County Board of Commissioners and language advocate, I'm proud to say that we've expanded the outreach to include the 12 languages, um, which include Russian, Polish, Urdu, uh, Korean, Ukrainian, Arabic, Pagola, and Boart. So we're, we're proud of those efforts, but we couldn't have done it. We couldn't have done it without all of you. And you've been on the battlefield for access for a very, very long time. So let me just thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of your hard work in helping us through this project. Um, you know, partnerships work, and it's, it's important to um, get the advocates involved when you want to do something that's really going to raise the bar. And I think that we've done some of that. My office has worked closely with people, these folks uh, here today, but they also helped us because we had to recruit bilingual election judges and the use of language sample ballots outreach event. Now, I'm just going to ask, I've given you a thumbnail sketch of who these folks are, so I'm going to ask each one of them to introduce themselves. Tell us just a little bit about the work that you've done to expand ballot access and to promote equality. Jerry, you want to start? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Claire Piarbo. Yes, I was recruited uh, uh, two years ago, I think 2019, when uh, uh, the office started to implement uh, the vote uh, act. And uh, I was so excited because that's part of my advocacy. And I immediately just say yes, you know, and not even knowing what to do, right, or, or the extent of my responsibilities. But when um, Ed uh, told me that I'll be involved in outreach, which is what I've been doing in the community, and then translating uh, the voting uh, materials, I said, this is perfect. I was already retired, but I said, okay, I'm willing to give my time because this is for the community. And besides, this is really acknowledging uh, the importance of language to immigrant communities. That's right. You can just feel, you know, uh, the isolation of uh, immigrants or even being intimidated not to participate because they just don't know the language. Right? So it's some sort of uh, liberation, a feeling of liberation that now they know what they are going, <laughs> that they are voting for something and they know why they are voting, right? And this is through this uh, uh, language access. Yeah, we had only, I think, uh, eight languages at that time. And then the following year, I think last year, we included uh, four more languages. And, and I think we are the most progressive county, county in, 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 in the nation in doing this. So thank you very much, uh, Claire Tiarbo, for, for, implement, uh, for implementing and supporting uh, this very important um, ordinance. Well, even though you were retired, Jerry, we couldn't have done it without you. So thank you again from the bottom of my heart for all of your hard work and for coming out of retirement. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, let's go to Amy. Amy, you want to tell us um, just a little bit about yourself and, and how were you involved in the process of access to the ballot? Sure, absolutely. Good afternoon again, everyone. I'm Ami Gandhi with Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. And I've been with this organization about five years and leading our voting rights practice area in a variety of ways, working with community members, working with government officials to try to improve the conditions for racial equity when it comes to our voting system. The way I got my start in this field was in my previous position several years ago, when I had the chance to work with Asian Americans Advancing Justice Chicago in advancing language access to the polls in particular. Those were some of my very first experiences working with community members in Chinatown, for example, and in other neighborhoods across the region. And, um, you know, I had always been to Devon Avenue and some of the nearby suburban areas where a lot of people from my community live when I was growing up, but I had not fully appreciated 
the different life situations that people may be coming from. You know, the huge range in terms of income, education level, and um, privilege or lack of privilege in getting settled in um, in the journey in the states, in the United States. And so it was very eye opening for me to get those experiences um, and getting informed by those election day experiences. I know we all get excited here by election day and it's just a special energy, a sense of community. It can also be kind of stressful and chaotic, but I realized I, I love that. I love getting to be a part of hopefully some problem solving, you know, hopefully some uh, unique collaborations where if unexpected issues come up for voters, for community members, that we can find a way to work together to overcome those issues. And so that's really what has energized me throughout my career. Um, previously, it was super specifically focused on the Asian American and South Asian communities, and my heart will always be there. And one of the things that I've been um, able to do in um, my time at Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights is help bridge, build bridges across communities of color. So. Um, now, even though I'm not working only exclusively with the Asian American community, I really appreciate that I can work with a diversity of communities of color who, who are all trying to gain fair access to the polls. Well, thank you. And to you, we couldn't have done it without you. Um, I know we have more work to do in this area. And I just hope that, you know, as we go forward, that we can count on you to um, help us continue our quest. We're not done yet. Any, can you tell us a little more about you? I love your background. I'm feeling that. <laughs> it's actually Chicago, doesn't it? Oh. It doesn't look like it's, it's Chicago. Beautiful. So, yes, it's a different perspective and, you know, the, you know, where we are. Um, no, thank you again for having, you know, having, inviting me here to be in this space and to be here with old friends, Jerry and Ami. They're the best people. Um, you know, and Jerry's like, yeah, he, he's, he's, he's a senior, right? right. So he's so been at the at forefront the of all of our work. Um, Clark Garber, can I ask if you could mute? Because I think I hear echo. Yeah. Am I, is it me? I'm hearing echo as I'm speaking. I'm so sorry. I'm just trying to understand. Any, okay, so it's, it's better now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think for me, you know, uh, so HANA Center actually is a merged organization that we merged in 2017 uh, of two of the oldest Korean American organizations that started back in 1972 as a service organization, and then another one in 1995 as an organizing and advocacy organization. And so, you know, as immigrants, you know, um, language is power. We viscerally live and experience how the power of language and power of, you know, English in this context. So we know that, you know, at, at the very uh, basics, you know, providing linguistically appropriate and culturally appropriate services and all of the ways that we work together has, is really more critical than any other context. So in that way, uh, we also know that you have to provide services to meet the immediate needs of our community, but we also have to work at the systemic level so that we don't just continue doing the same thing over and over and over, but we get at the root cause of the very problem that we are facing. So we know that, you know, we have to work on getting like legislation, things like this, this language access is huge, right? And so from the get-go, as the organizing organization started, we knew that, um, civic engagement is really huge. We know that in order to all the amazing changes that we made, not only about the language access, but we just also uh, uh, won a lot of different legislation in this session, right? And there's one that actually was a defender for all to have a uh, uh, public defender in an immigration court that was led by Cook County commissioners. So to in order to have all these things, it's a result of all of our great work like Hana Center, you know, a fire and lawyers committee, all these people working together uh, is a result of that. And in order for, for legislators to listen to us, we know that we have to come out, our voters, our citizens have to come out in critical mass. And again, language is so critical. And we see this as like we have, uh, you know, we support, we, we do year-round integrated uh, civic engagement work 
at the HANA Center. And it's, we've been doing this since 90. 94 was the first election. 96 was the first major election that we did with a, we do like voter uh, guide. We do voter education. We hold candidates forums, things like that to, to support our voters to be informed and then be active uh, voters. And in that course, we, uh, we meet, you know, especially like people who say, I became a citizen 20 years ago, but I was so scared to even register to vote, let alone vote. So I've not done that, but now we do because of you all. So that, I know that's not unique to the Korean community. It's really unique. It's, it's really prevalent in all of our immigrant communities. So language assistance is really critical. And I got myself involved because I'm a, I immigrated to the U.S. Uh, with my family when I was 12. And uh, because I'm a first generation also in knowing both languages, I grew up being a translator, grew up being an advocate for my parents. And so you learn how, because of the language, not knowing the language, full functioning you know, uh, adults are not able to function fully or can't do the work that they were interested in because of the language. So, you know, I entered into this work after college, you know, I just have to, uh, you know, be part of the work that uplifts them as well. And so that's how I entered. And so I actually was a volunteer from like 94, 96, you know, to voter registering people at uh, churches and streets and markets and all of that that we used to do. And then, you know, I had different roles in the organization to be where we are, but we really have continued. And just, just to share that, like in 2020, HANA Center, with the census work and the election, uh, we reached uh, about 120,000 Asian, Korean American and Asian American voters. The majority are in Cook County, um, and so like 10th Congressional District. So, you know, that's the kind of work that we do year round. So uh, we continue to do that in this language access accessibility now with, the, with uh, you know, at the ballot uh, is huge. It's so huge, but we still need to be at the, at the polling places because there's a lot of like voter rights violations. And I actually call AMI, like, is this right? This happened, this, you know, it's different candidates. People are there really doing blocking and uh, there's a lot of suppression there as well. So we couldn't have done it without, especially AMI, but you know, lawyers committee and also advancing justice. We also contact them too on the election day. You know, I so appreciate you sharing your story. I think that, um, I think we need to do more of that with each other, you know, the, you know, kind of a cross pollination, if you will. Um, when we share our stories the way you just did, it makes me um, really understand better who you are and, you know, what your background is. I mean, you know, we all, we work, we go to all kinds of things in community, but in sharing our respective stories, I just think it adds a really, it's kind of like, um, adding seasoning to um, who we are. And so thank you so much for sharing uh, your story. Um, I want to uh, talk about challenges, um, challenges to voting access. And you kind of uh, touched on it. I'd like to hear from Jerry and Ami about um, what are you seeing in your communities, and, and particularly you know, at, at a time like this, where states across the, the country, they're purging the voter rolls and making it more difficult. You know, here we are in Illinois trying to expand the vote, and we see what's happening across the country. What, what do you think about that? What do you see? Jerry, you want to start? Yeah, all you have to do, yeah, unmute. Yeah, there you are. <coughs> Thank you for asking. Uh, well, I, what I've seen in at least in the last election, uh, uh, the the enthusiasm of the community to participate is there uh, because of the uh, language uh, uh, translation of the uh, voting materials. However, uh, uh, registering voters are still a problem. Uh, we 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 need to to have a, a one on one uh, conversation uh, to. Uh, convinced that they have to vote, for, especially for uh, old citizens. As what uh, Inham mentioned earlier, uh, our, our work in the community to uh, convince a long-time uh, permanent residents to become citizens 
is also a barrier, right? Uh, because of this question of uh, loyalty uh, to the old uh, country, sure. right? And and then so so that that barrier has to be broken. That they are part of now part of America, and they have to actually embrace that uh, responsibility or duty to participate in the electoral process. Uh, but last year, I think was a different situation because it's too polarized, right? It's too polarized that our community were so divided that uh, people sometimes they just say, don't vote. So, so that's another barrier. Uh, uh, the climate of uh, the climate, the election climate last year is so different from other, other uh, election cycles, I, I would say, right? Uh, but I think uh, with the continuing uh, community outreach, continuing uh, use of uh, language as, as part of uh, the tools that we can use uh, to make them participate, uh, will need to be strengthened. Uh, la language is, is going through their hearts, as what uh, Ine was saying. Uh, once we establish that, then there will be some, some sort of trust. And, 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 you know, at least in Illinois, we, we've never seen these uh, uh, challenges or protests about the election process. And I've seen, and I've seen, the, I've seen the way uh, 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 Dominion work with us in, in uh, uh, processing uh, the election uh, translation. So I, I can vouch that the system is, is, is really following some sort of uh, an organized manner that the uh, rights of the uh, uh, voters are protected, right? And and making sure that uh, the counting and everything will be uh, in order. So the, the way I, I'm looking at it, uh, there will still be barriers, current, uh, 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 but but I think uh, community outreach is important. I'm glad you brought up the um, last year's election because I agree with you. Um, never did we have to defend um, the office for the job that we do. There's so many people involved in, in the job of, of voting and making sure that people have access and their vote is protected and all of those things. And so last year, um, you know, prior years, our focus was on cybersecurity. Um, last year, we were trying to beat down these horrible stories and negatives about, you know, your vote doesn't count. Um, the election is stolen, all of those kinds of things. It was horrible. And, you know, it was kind of sent us reeling because we, we, we take our job so very seriously in what we do in protection of the vote. So thank you for bringing that up uh, as one of the challenges that we have, not just for um, people just joining the process, you know, with the new languages, but everybody had to deal with that and trying to figure it out. And so you can understand why somebody would want to just throw their hands up and say, well, I'm just not going to bother. So, I mean, what do you, what do you think about, um, our, do you, what do you think of the greatest challenges um, to voting access in um, communities that, you know, we're reaching out to to give them access in their own language? You know, on its own, each little piece of the process, whether it's signing a voter registration form or figuring out where is my polling place, each one on its own can seem pretty straightforward, especially when there are tools like the Cook County Clerk's website and, you know, some of the amazing personnel who are available to answer questions. But on its own, the whole system can be perplexing to a lot of our community members. It can be and not just confusing, but it can be stressful. It can be burdensome, even when there's no intention of anything like that. Um, and, and for people unfamiliar with the system, it can be um, a uphill battle. It can feel like that for people. If one little piece of it goes wrong or is confusing, or they may either get some conflicting information or just might, might get confused or unfamiliar on their own, but if the result means they don't see the process through or their friends or family members hear about bad experiences and then they don't want to get involved, then it's, you know, we all would feel sad in that situation and would feel like it's a missed opportunity. So I think for either newly eligible 
voters or maybe people who were eligible but for whatever reason had not interacted with the system before it can be mystifying and someone might feel like i have i feel like i have a dumb question about this process but we all know that we we want everyone to have their questions answered we want everyone to have the resources they need so that they can participate and then the other the other aspect i wanted to mention is those people who are close to our hearts who are not yet eligible voters. So I know that at election time, all of us and all of the institutions we work with are super clear about who is eligible to vote. And um, we know from the data that it's um, that that there's not a threat in our election system nationally or locally of ineligible people participating. But the question still remains it, because of our families, because of our communities. What about people who wanna have a say, but who are not yet eligible under our current laws? Could there be, can we dream of a day when there can be more people who can weigh in about the elected officials who represent us? And that's that's something that uh, keeps me up at night as well. And you know, one of our current legislative initiatives uh, for Chicago Lawyers Committee is um, uh, we we helped write a bill that would re-enfranchise voters in prison who are currently not eligible to vote in Illinois. Now, the bill did not pass in Springfield by May 31st, but we will not give up um, because, you know, there, there may have been historical reasons to disenfranchise community members along those lines, but those reasons don't hold up anymore. You know, we all we all know that it's not fair or equitable to disenfranchise primarily people of color or primarily black and brown populations. Um, so I I hope that we can you know expand in our imagination and thinking about who could be the electorate in the future. I think we will, and I, and I think uh, as long as you stay involved and keep pushing that uh, ball up that very tall hill, I think it'll happen. What I, what I have found, um, as I guess most of you know, uh, I serve time in the legislature. And um, sometimes it's a, a multi-year bill. Sometimes it's a, I, I know I can't carrying the death penalty bill. And the, that was, a, oh my goodness, that was like over uh, decades that that bill finally got to me. You know, so I just put on the shoulders of others. So let me just encourage you to continue the fight because the fight continues. So um, uh, for, for you, I'm going to just uh, uh, inhale. I want to say um, there's got to be some other steps that we could take to expand access to the ballot as broadly as possible to, a, to achieve a more, let's say, a democratic process. So I know we're taking baby steps. You know, we've, we've done some things, and, and we're going to continue to do some things. But where should we start focusing our attention? You brought up some very good, some very good ideas here and some very good, you know, challenges that I think we want to help with, certainly here at the, at the clerk's office. So can you, can you just maybe talk about some additional steps that we can do to expand access to the ballot? I mean, that's a large question. I would love to think more and actually come back uh, with some more informed. And, you know, we at the HANA Center work with uh, communities, so we engage them. We engage the impacted people and center their leadership in all of our work. So it would be great to actually hear from our community members and voters and bring that back to you. Uh, but I wanted to also just kind of mention about, you know, bringing it kind of really local, local as an example also, as we have these amazing, you know, really we're progressing on some systemic levels, like, like the language access and the ways that, you know, lawyers committees working and, you know, a fire groups like that are all working hard. But I also want to just say that there are a lot of what the additional barriers actually come at the voting day. You know, when voters go, what happens in polling places? Sure. Uh, as I said, that, that, that the, you know, folks from like different campaigns come and try to really maneuver, you know, they really try to um, not suppress voters or suppress voters that they think that they're voting in a different way and really block them. But many of the election judges and people who work at the polls often are not as informed about the kind of rights and laws that 
is allowed for people who need assistance, whether it's language or, you know, someone who may, it's like, you know how, even like the ballot, sometimes they, you, you cross the line, sometimes you put the dot, like changes are hard for people. As, as, as Ami said, every step is very intimidating. We have a situation where, again, we have immigrant citizens, newly citizens who wanna participate, but they're so intimidated. So we have like seniors that come take three buses with like bag grocery plastic bag of all the the mailing that people the, the candidates give. They're like, what is this? Like I I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Am I supposed to do something? If I don't, am I breaking the law? There's that way that so many of the first generations think. So the intimidation is something that we cannot stress enough what it means to them. So then they go to the polling place and then when I, I've walked in and, and uh, you know, I'm holding, they want to hold hands. I walk in, two of us, and the polling, the election judge is yelling at us that you cannot, two people can't come in all at once, only one at a time. Then the grandma was shaking her hand and she said, I don't want to vote. I don't want to do, why am I getting yelled at, right? Or, you know, your driver's license is not enough. You need to have that voter card. Well, I don't have it. So then that already becomes like another example. Or we have a situation in the, you know, one Schomburg Public Library was actually a site where all this was happening and they don't let voters who are senior citizens who are waiting in line to sit. They say you're not allowed to sit. Stuff like that is actually happening on the day of, right? And so we have actually have one site in Chicago where there's always like an issue. We have to call somebody to mediate the situation. So you know, uh, we have brought these attention to David Orr, you know, Clark Orr, and actually he helped change the polling site because of so much, you know, we think of that as racism, right? It's like, it, it, it's such a supremacy in so many ways that really makes immigrants or, or non-white people or non-English speaking people really intimidated. So I would say one uh, big ask is I know there's always an improvement, but to really train all the poll, I know there's training, but to really emphasize like how to support non-English speaking uh, voters on top of getting these like um, really awesome, amazing uh, legislation passed and really, you know, maybe listen to like, uh, we would love to bring back with you a lot more uh, suggestions from the voters about looking, how we could do that. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it because uh, the more we can engage and you let us know how we can be helpful, we will do that. And, you know, what I want to do, uh, uh, very quickly. I know uh, Ed Michalowski is on this call. Um, I don't see his face um, here, but he's home, um, actually convalescing from surgery, but he just so wanted to be a part of us. But I want to wish him well, and I want him to get well for sure. Um, Ed was very um, helpful in this whole process, and he was so excited about this whole thing to make sure it came off. So so Ed, we're waving at you right now and uh, wishing you well and, and uh, thank you for all you've done in this process. Uh, Ed is a wonderful, he, he, he really cares about this process and, and he's hearing all of you and I'm sure he's going to uh, be reaching out to you uh, to see how we can be more helpful. Some of the things that you talked about here though are problems, not just for people, uh, but, you know, just becoming um, um, acclimated to the uh, the ballot, what have you. Some of those things that are happening on election day, we hear from all of our voters, all of our judges. And so we're looking for ways in which to engage and to address some of those issues. Now there's one last question I wanna ask, and I really would like to know um, how um, Rotarians can be engaged and involved to be helpful. Um, there are many of them on the line. You know, we're collaborating with the uh, Rotary Club of Baywood Proviso. And um, our motto is service above self. And I don't know if any of you are a Rotarian, but we take that very, very seriously. And in a time where hate crimes against members of the Asian American communities are on the rise across our nation, how can we be helpful to educate ourselves and advocate for victims and community members. This is so important. And I know um, our president, he travels quite a bit um, to China uh, on a regular basis and he does um, education work 
there, and I'm sure he's going to have something to say um, as soon as we're at the end of our program. But um, please tell us, what can we do? How can we help? Jerry? Well, good news, uh, because uh, we're just waiting for the governor to sign the uh, uh, Teaching Equitable Asian American Community History Act. Uh, which will paint a more complete uh, picture of our shared history by adding uh, Asian American history to the Illinois school code. This is very important because many of the reports that we've been receiving, uh, the reason why there is an uptick or there's a con consisting, a constant uh, uh, hate crime against uh, Asian is because of our inv invisibility or lack of presence, right? And it starts actually from 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 the school because the school uh, they don't include the the history of Asians and therefore they don't know the contributions of uh, Asian Americans. But I would like to mention uh, uh, the work that I've done with uh, with the Maywood uh, Proviso community when when I was when I was uh, advocating for uh, a Filipino World War II veterans. Uh, equity uh, struggle. Uh, the community helped us in reaching out uh, to uh, the high school, uh, the high school in Proviso and the high school created some sort of a history of uh, the connection of the, uh, of the, I forgot the, the name of the uh, 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 contingent from, from Maywood who were uh, stationed in, in the Philippines, that there's a connection uh, with, with, with the Filipino soldiers, right? So I think uh, I, I would suggest that uh, same thing should happen. Uh, the communities like uh, Maywood and Proviso to engage their schools to start this uh, implementing uh, the, uh, uh, the teaching act, which means uh, when, as you said earlier, when we share stories, right, and and we look at the connections that we had in the past and in the present, uh, we, we we can start to to address uh, some issues of uh, violence and inequality, right? Uh, it's it's a long story. Uh, the colonization uh, colonization of our country, uh, uh, I will point out to be the source of this. Uh, lingering uh, hate, hatred. To Jerry, you were talking about Bataan. The Bataan, yes. The Bataan organization, yes, I go to that every year, and I've met so many wonderful people there. And um, so, so um, our president um, has a question for for all of you, and it's in the chat. He says, um, "Bob, would you like to ask your question?" Uh, come off of mute and ask. Okay. I'm asking our panelists. Thank you, um, Clerk Yarborough. Do you agree our national leaders have provided a poor example for the nation? What behaviors would you recommend to reduce the hostility in our communities and families resulting not only from polariz polarization, but disrespect to those who don't hold our views? This leads to hostility throughout our ethnic and family cultures, perhaps leads to people not voting. And perhaps we need a new vocabulary, new behaviors that would allow us to have differing views and still respect each other. So what behaviors would you look for from our national leaders? And I might add the media that would be less polarizing. And I'll just start. Name calling has no place in either the media or in our national leadership. What would you add to that? Anybody can answer. I appreciate that question. Um, I don't pretend to have a complete answer. Those are questions that I certainly wrestle with as well. But thank you, Robert, for sharing what's on your mind. Um, I, one area of work that all of us have been engaged in together has been to call out white supremacy if it's something we experience or it's something we see with the idea to try to build towards something better. So I don't mean that solely as a negative, but we all know that there's a, a better way forward. 
and some uh, how that plays out in Illinois may be different from some other places because it, there may be something overt that occurs that harms community members of color and it may be something more subtle that requires some unpacking and hearing that person out about what they experienced and, and honoring that and trying to figure out a way to be supportive. It, it's not, it may not sound exactly related, but these are the kind of community sentiments that I'll come to the clerk's office with actually, you know, during a heated moment, during a contested election, it brings out a lot of feelings um, naturally for, for voters who care deeply about the outcome. And um, I also want to extend my best wishes for recovery to Ed. And, you know, whether it's talking with Ed or other colleagues at the Cook County Clerk's Office, I'm thinking about Jonathan Williams and others who we've worked with over the years, we really appreciate and um, more importantly, voters really appreciate when they have the chance to be heard because what, hap what might happen to them at a polling place, an instance of you know, perhaps being excluded or facing an undue barrier or being subjected to some confusion or inconsistent rules, uh, that can make someone feel singled out. And it's important to honor that experience and to, um, to try to figure out where to go from here to bring accountability to the system when that's what's needed in order for that person's rights to be respected. And, um, you know, for all of us to keep in mind that what, what could have been exclusionary to one person, um, may, I may not have picked up on that right away, but in hearing them out, that, that could make the difference of how we can protect their rights. And so um, that's uh, the reason I bring that up is because it's an area where the collaboration with the Cook County Clerk's Office has been really valuable and has often led to you know, um, what otherwise might be voting rights violations, but because there's a spirit of problem solving together, it gets resolved you know, in the moment. And, and I just really appreciate and respect that. Okay, thank you. Anybody want to add something to that? Um, I, I mentioned, uh, in, oh, in, oh, please, please. Yeah, yes. Um, I think, yeah, thank you for the question. And I think also that, you know, uh, just adding to Ami's comments that, you know, yes, the, the leadership, the type of rhetoric that we have been hearing uh, you know, last year, the, especially around pandemic and all of that, we believe really has exacerbated, you know, all these, uh, especially in the spike of Asian American, you know, hate. Um, although the violence against Asian Americans have been existence, you know, way before. There's a long, long history uh, dating before to, you know, the turn of the century. So this is all linked, right? But so, I mean, those need to really change, like that just needs to stop. But I also want to say that I think in this time, you know, as a community based organization working with community based members, you know, there's a lot of ways that when this kind of stuff happens, how do everyday citizens react to that? It's like, oh, something happened, you call the police. So then like we had incidences where uh, somebody, uh, one of our community members got rock thrown at, at the uh, H mark. So she got hurt, she called the police, police comes and says, Oh, that's not hate crime. That's like you didn't get penetrated enough. It wasn't bad enough. There's no way to prove it was racially motivated, right? Same thing on a, a I tell this story. A driver, an Amazon driver delivered something, and the white person who was getting this package literally beat him up, you know, as he got delivered. So he called the police too. And then they said they couldn't prove the racially motivatedness of the situation and that it wasn't hate crime. So it becomes a situation where when you engage in that, you know, calling the police, is it what kind of crime is it? It becomes actually added burden and stress on the survivor, the victim. And so all this to say, and then these people are like, you know, there's, you know, I, I know there's limitations too from the government, like report this, we have to respond in this way. But from the community perspective, all these are in some ways not getting at the real issue, right? And so I think what we are saying is that I think, I know I'm speaking to the go the government officials, but we have to really look at like, and you know, we hear, we talk a lot about reimagining, but I think we have to. So instead of like same old ways that we know and same instinctive ways that we respond to any situation, you know, I think this is a moment to really, why is all this happening, right? So like even in Chicago where we hear or where we see in the media where the, the Asian Americans are hurt are usually perpetrated by men, uh, black men, 
That's what we see more. But when you look at the statistics that was collected, that's one way to understand, right? Uh, you know, over 70% were white people. But then what we see more is the black people. And then when, where the incidences are happening are in areas where the homeless people are. In Chicago, there's like 80% of the people who are homeless are black, black, black people. So we have to question why is that happening? And why is it that these are, you know, there's so many other social uh, deficits and, and uh, you know, support needs that they don't have because so much of the funding is going to the police and all these systems that in the community's perspective is not working. I know, you know, th there's a lot of conversations about defunding police and a lot of, you know, uh, mobilizations and demonstrations. But I think we have to really listen to why is that happening? Why are these people saying these things? They're not just young, you know, young people who don't know and they just want everything. I think we have to listen to that. I think we have to really listen to what are some other ways, like how do maybe we could take some of the funding more towards social programs. You know, how do we support them? So I think that those are the ways that uh, also that also needs to change and challenge when we see something in the media. Why are we seeing just a pattern when that's actually not true? You know, and just one additional thing I just want to say is that the conservative right, ultra right are actually uh, targeting immigrants targeting limited English speaking people through the media of, of our countries of origin. So in the case of Korean community, you know, like the everything that's happening that's like fake news or whatever, it goes straight to Korea, then they send it to the Korean language specific chat rooms, just like the WeChat with the Chinese uh, language uh, chat rooms. So there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of anger that's just being nurtured all the time, just brewing. So, you know, that's also adding to even our own community, within our own immigrant and people of color communities that we have to be really mindful. And that's why we need so much more like social programs and, and real community based, real needed. Uh, we need to respond based on the real needs and that actually listen to the vision and not think of that as something that that's ill-informed, but actually maybe that they're more informed because they're lived experiences. Wow. <laughs> We're having a really deep conversation here. And um, my, my um, staff is asking me if we would just stop for a moment so we can take a picture, you know, so put on your best smile. There we go. Cody, are we good? We're good. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So, um, you know, I want to, um, I've been to China, I, and I'm looking at what's in the chat um, that um, our president's uh, talking about. Um, and I've been to China, and, you know, I've learned a lot being there. But I've been to Taiwan, and I've learned a lot when I was there as well. But you know what I found? I found that people are people wherever they are. And you know, you've got some good people, bad people, other otherwise. And then people have been indoctrinated into some um, some things that I would never, you know, um, engage in. But you know, you know what I want to do is, Bob, um, could you come back on again and just kind of share, you know, what you've been doing uh, in China and what you and your wife um, have experienced there. Yeah, Bonnie, whoops, you can hear me, right? Yes. Um, Bonnie and I decided right about the time we were going to retire that we wanted to continue to try to make the world a better place. And um, we started off by, I just bought a ticket to fly to Beijing, or I printed some business cards and went to public places, children's theater, et cetera, and talked to folks about education. And um, what our primary goal was ministry, well, that's the case. We also were working really hard to create positive relationships between citizens while our national leaders might screw up relationships and put us on the verge of destroying our planet. Um, when we talk to citizens one-on-one, -on -one, we can create a, a great loving relationship. And so we, we agreed that we would, and we've been there four times in the past three years, we uh, started providing free services to teachers and students where we would train teachers on teaching techniques, and we would discuss strategies for improving learning in the classroom, and and also helping folks to understand our culture, uh, dispelling myths about our culture, and acknowledging and confessing the challenges that our 
U.S. culture faces. We try to be highly transparent, highly respectful, and provide unconditional love. And, and we've gotten a great response. We've had over 100 Chinese teachers and children actually come to visit in the past three years. So, so Bob, do you think that um, it, it sounds like you're saying um, kind of what I've been thinking, that the one-on-one -on -one relationships, they, they work. They really do. Once we get to know each other, we understand each other's stories, we understand each other as a person, um, that can break down some of these barriers rather than looking at, you know, the whole group. You know, um, Inhe was talking about, you know, um, you know crime. And, you know, the media has a big role to play in what we see and hear. And when you see a black man, um, they make him look menacing, of course. And, you know, when you look at our numbers, you know, as an African-American woman, and you look at, when I look at our numbers in the country, or just in the state of Illinois, what, our numbers are not the kind of numbers that, you know, that should be shown on media as being, okay, this this, this uh, area here, this is a terrible place because this black man did this. Uh, you know, wow. <laughs> you know, so the media is is really fanning the flames when it comes to any persons of, of color. And I think that, you know, while you touched on it a little bit about the media, I, I get it, you know, when it leads, when it bleeds, it leads kind of themes that media has had. But, you know, they've got to be more responsible as well. It's just not quite that way. What do you think? Media have a responsibility here? Well, I think so greatly, and I think on both sides. I think that uh, when I mentioned name-calling, I think there's some alternatives to complaining about what's going wrong. One is for folks to realize, while well, you can get votes by vilifying the opposition, that we could also be better leaders by demonstrating a pursuit or a desire to, to understand um, continuous improvement as a model of our own performance and our own party, whatever that party might be, um, identifying points of agreement, um, asking for evidence to support views. You know, I think there's a little focus on evidence. We just make our sound bites and then go on to the next sound bite and then discredit the person that made the sound bite. And we get into this kind of tit for tat rather than acting responsibly and, and really seeking to bring this country together, agree to support uh, views, pilot solutions, uh, and objectively measure the results. Uh, you know, everyone's definition of objectivity is different as well. And finally, um, lead ourselves in such a way that we're testing hypotheses rather than always trying to prove a point. So this is some thoughts about that. Well, thank you. Thank you for... for um um, throwing those out uh, to us. Listen, um, we've got five minutes left, and in this last uh, couple of minutes, I'd like to have some closing remarks from all of you, if you would. Um, this has been very fruitful, certainly for me. Um, I'm a world traveler, and I enjoy meeting new people, and um, I guess, you, you know, I also enjoy um, having one-on-ones with people to hear their stories because I find their stories to be um, interesting, invigorating, and it gives, expands my uh, understanding of who people are. So would you like to, uh, Jerry, I'm going to start with you uh, again. Um, would you, do you have some closing remarks for us? Well, first thing, thank you for uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, 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 conversation. And also wishing uh, uh, Ed for his uh, uh, early recovery. Uh, what, what I would say uh, is to continue this kind of conversation, I think we, we need to open the door of understanding through conversation. Good things happen when people talk and share ideas. And, uh, and education would be a, a, a starting point for, for us to open our minds and hearts to, to understand and understanding others. And, and maybe I can throw in uh, the, the importance of history. So maybe uh, the office can also include in its, uh, in the website or whatever, 
the the history of uh, of uh, uh, election, the history of how people got the right to vote, because I think it's still uh, uh, important to know that this inequality is rooted in in our own history, wherein even uh, black people were not con uh, were not considered as complete person, right? So, so, so I, th I I think uh, if we can include, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm hearing echoes, uh, but I think we if we can include in the website or in the educational uh, materials of the of the clerk's office to include the history of empowering people you know how they empower themselves and and to deepen the conversation about democracy you know the importance of the contribution of uh, all citizens and, and and i think it it's hard to change behavior it's hard to change behavior but i think uh, we have to support our uh, structures, our institutions, to be more open and and to to be courageous enough to interrog interrogate this kind of uh, issues like uh, racism, white supremacy. You know, uh, we, we don't want to be forever um, foreigners. We don't want forever to become yellow peril. You know. Uh, we have our own history of fighting. We have our own history of uh, fighting inequality. So, so I think this is wonderful uh, project, uh, uh, Claire Karen, to have conversation, open conversation about human rights and equality. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry, so much. And you better know our, our communication team is listening to you intently and um, I think you're going to see some things roll out from our office. I agree with you wholeheartedly about um, sharing history so that people understand, you know, and opening up um, their knowledge and understanding of who people are. Um, I have now uh, two minutes, so uh, Ami, uh, do you have um, a one minute remark and so we can have one minute um, from NE2? Sure, absolutely. You know, in the 2016 election, when I was in the midst of my voter protection work, my nonpartisan voter protection work for Chicago Lawyers Committee, I was helping uh, address a situation where a voter had been intimidated and told the wrong closing poll closing time by a police. We got that resolved, and then someone walked by and didn't know who I was or what I was doing and told me to go back to where I came from, you know, wanted me to not vote there. And uh, it was, this was not in suburban Cook County. Um, it, immediately, an election official, uh, election personnel saw what happened, made me feel comfortable, and, uh, you know, helped me in a situation that was uh, pretty difficult and emotional for me. And, you know, that's what we have to do is to speak up if something happens. That person who yelled at me didn't know I'm from Indiana, actually, and uh, they didn't care. They're judging me based on how I how I looked. And um, these things happen even in Illinois, unfortunately, but it is something we can address. Um, so if we're sensitive to people's experiences that they may have in these situations, we can all uh, be better off as a result. So if you see something, say something. And if you hear something, you need to speak up, right? Thank you. Any, how about yeah. you? I just want to say ditto to everything Jerry said so eloquently and what Ami said. And I just want to say that in terms of Teach Act, uh, you know, we all work so hard for it, but we know that passing is one thing and implementing is another. So right. we really look for you and your leadership and all of the commissioners and everybody to make sure that all Illinois schools actually teach this. So that would be really key. And also remember to listen to the everyday community impact the community people's voices and how value that and really be led by that vision. And third thing is just always remember language is power. And we thank you so much for recognizing that and to really make sure that we empower all of our voters in Cook County and beyond. Thank you. All of our guests, thank you from the bottom of my heart. This has been so enriching. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll be reaching out to you again. Mr. President, that concludes our program. Oh.
Another home run out of the ballpark, Clerk Yarborough. For our guest, um, I'll welcome and thank you at the same time. Welcome and unyang uh, hasayo. Um, namaste, assalamu alaikum, uh, ni hao. And uh, I left one out, I think. And thank you. Um Shukriya. Shay Shukriya, danyavad. Um, we're grateful for you to be here. <laughs> and um, with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. God bless you all. <laughs>